Hello, my name is Reverend Dr. May Elise Cannon. I'm still in Jerusalem, and today is Sunday, January 14th. This is day 100 since October 7th. Last night, I stayed up and I watched parts of the March for Gaza in Washington, D.C. Yesterday was a day of action, a day around the world of people committed to calling for a ceasefire. Thousands of people marched in Washington, D.C. and in other major cities around the world, calling for an end to the occupation and the bombing of Gaza, calling for a ceasefire and an end to violence against all civilians. Protesters at the D.C. rally we heard from numerous speakers from Nihad Awad, executive director of the Council on American Islamic Relations, presidential candidate Jill Stein, Colorado State Rep. Aman Joday, and family members of people killed in Gaza among many others. Churches for Middle East Peace and many other Christian organizations hosted a prayer vigil in front of the White House, praying to God that he would intervene, that he would change President Biden's heart, that President Biden would have compassion for both Israelis and Palestinians who've lost loved ones and had people killed. But most of all, that the United States would stop sending weapons that are supporting this horrific war and that the US would support a comprehensive ceasefire. The prayer vigil included songs for peace and a cry for justice. I've been asked um, online and uh, numerous times at churches um, over the past several months, where is God in the midst of all of this? How often have we prayed for peace and the bombing still continues? There seems to be no response to our prayers. Where is God? It reminds me of the Psalms when we cry out, oh Lord, how long? This past week, I had the opportunity to pray in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, considered by many to be the holiest site in all of Christendom, in the old city of Jerusalem. It was nearly empty. It's a personal, um, it's a sacred place for me personally. For years ago, it's where God called me to serve in the Middle East, or to at least engage with the Middle East. It was a calling that I had. Um, a place called the Adams Chapel. Um, it's located underneath um, Golgotha. It's uh, supposed to be where the bones of Adam uh, were buried. And symbolically, or maybe people um, believe this traditionally, it is the idea that Christ was crucified on Golgotha and the blood of Christ shed, came down the rock and covered over the bones of Adam so that the sins of all people who believe in Jesus would be forgiven, even unto all of the descendants of Adam. All um, I wanted to do when I visited the church this week was to sit, to be with God, to catch my breath, to pray. Um, it was a place that God had first called me to Jerusalem, to the Middle East. I was desperate to hear from God, to be with him, to have a moment of silence, um, comfort, <laughs> presence. I knew that there wouldn't be very many people in the church because um, Jerusalem's pretty empty right now. But when I arrived, the church was under construction significantly. Adam's Chapel actually couldn't even find it. Uh, there were construction barriers and tarps everywhere. Sounds echoed throughout the sacred chapel's chambers. And I was able to find a, a little bench and kind of a small nook in the huge cathedral. And I prayed the Lord's Prayer and some of the Psalms. But in the midst of it, there was banging and hammering and <laughs> chainsaws and construction noises and interruptions. It was the antithesis of silence. There were forklifts that were backing up, making that horrific beeping noise. Um, all of the noises of the world, much like the interruptions of the world, seek to separate us from God. Um, it wasn't unlike actually the prayer vigil at the White House last night. I'd stayed up late. I was waiting. Um, it was supposed to stream at 11 o'clock Jerusalem time, but there were delays. There was traffic. Um, there were so many people because of the march that things were a bit chaotic. And I ended up getting on our email and letting other people know that the vigil was going to be delayed. So it started 15 minutes late and then the sound didn't work and, you know, all that kind of thing. And finally, when it did start, then it was really hard to hear. It was so windy and then DC was overrun with so many activists and people. The Wi-Fi bandwidth was poor, and so you could only hear every third word of half the prayers, and the sound was muffled, and sirens were going off in the distance, and I started to feel frustrated, and I thought, God, where are you? And the team had worked so hard, and we're trying to you know, pull people together to pray and engage and call for a ceasefire, and I was reminded 
um, of a text that I received two nights ago from someone in Gaza that said, another blackout. All communications down. I'm communicating from a sim. I've not heard from that person since. And as I was trying to pray last night in the comfort of my warm bed, St. George's guest house on Nablus Road in East Jerusalem, and I was listening to the wind blowing and sirens in DC and watching a grainy picture and not really being able to hear much of what was being prayed or the calls for peace. I was overwhelmed. Someone in the chat said, I wish this sounded better. And I thought, me too. And then I shared my conviction, a good reminder of the smallest glimpse of what people in Gaza might experience, you know, <laughs> not being able to communicate. It was like a provocation that the world interrupts our connection with God. Might those be provocations that remind us to dig in all the harder, to pray all the more, to be committed in our convictions to take steps forward when we're interrupted, when there are, I was in a meeting uh, yesterday and someone said, may our obstacles become our pathways forward. May they actually help shape our direction. And so when we experience obstacles, might that motivate us to not give up? And then those of us online last night, we started kind of chatting and praying together and it became something really beautiful. And the same thing happened in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in the midst of the chaos of construction and the noise and the interruptions and the frustration. <laughs> And even feeling separate from God, I was thinking, where is God in the midst of all this? And in the midst of the chaos and feeling overwhelmed and the prayers that we have been praying for the violence to stop, and sometimes it doesn't only not stop, it gets so much worse. We know and hold on to the truths of God's promises. There's a verse, it's one of my favorites, I think it's in Numbers, that said, God is not a man that he should lie does he speak and then not act? Does he promise and then not fulfill? War and violence are not the end of the story. We worship a God of life and not death. Light will shine in the darkness and the darkness shall not overcome it. Now is the time to do what is right and we must not give up on what is good and right. Even when from an earthly perspective, it seems like we're losing the battle. We must be motivated and compelled by love and not hatred for that is the power of the peace that we are pursuing. We must allow our hearts to be broken for the things that break the heart of God and ask that God would expand our hearts, that we would have a greater capacity to love. We haven't the need to apologize when we have empathy for grieving people on all sides of the conflict, for it does not lessen our witness when we call for an end to the occupation and for a ceasefire in Gaza, but it strengthens our claims. We must be willing to enter into pain and brokenness, and people will hate us for it when we stand for justice. But the scriptures tell us it's a pure joy when we are persecuted for following the ways of God. The kingdom of God will prevail, and the gates of hell will not overwhelm us. So as we take a step forward every day, may that be our breath, prayer, and our mantra. The kingdom of God will prevail, and the gates of hell will not overwhelm it. May we continue to seek good and take steps forward toward peace. Amen.